Okay, Jeremy Gunawardner is Associate Professor of Systems Biology at Harvard University. He was previously at Hewlett Packard uh, Research during 1987 to 2001, and his work focuses on information processing in mammalian cells. Today he will talk on beyond big data and big model, the role of abstraction in biology. Okay, so um, I, I realize that um, if you're in this neck of the woods, you might not see <laughs> the bottom of the screen. My apologies about that. But if you're worried about it, um, ask me afterwards for a copy of the slides. Um, so I think we're all familiar with this um, phenomenon that, um, oh, microphone, yes. I think we're all familiar with this uh, fact that we're drowning in data. And uh, I don't really have to elaborate it very much. This is a, a plot. Um, actually, it's, a, uh, it's the continuation of what we just heard from George about sequencing. This is a plot of sequencing costs against time. And the straight line that you see there, this is a semi-log plot, is, uh, is Moore's law that was articulated by the founder of Intel for the development of computer technology. It, uh, it uh, increases in performance roughly, doubles in performance roughly one and a half, every one and a half years. And what you see from this is that sequencing costs are actually beating Moore's law. <laughs> uh, so, so we have entered a period of, um, of interaction with technology which has superseded what we knew from the computer revolution in the context of biological sequencing. Um, and so um, uh, we're in the process of being drowned in data. And at the same time that that's happening, uh, a completely different development has taken place with very different um, starting points and intellectual context. Um, and this uh, is also something I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Lee Sidol, uh, the uh, reigning world champion at Go, in the process of losing uh, a five game series to the uh, neural network called AlphaGo that was developed by uh, a company called DeepMind, a British company now taken up by Google and part of Google's uh, empire. Um, and uh, he was uh, successful in only one of those five games. And subsequent to that, um, the DeepMind team developed another version of AlphaGo, which they call AlphaGo Zero, uh, that was trained against AlphaGo and ultimately beats it 100 times out of 100. Um, and uh, in the course of uh, watching how AlphaGo Zero works by looking inside the black box, uh, they realized that it was rediscovering um, various cultural strategies for playing Go that had been developed over the course of human history and ultimately getting to a point where the strategies it discovered were new. Uh, and so AlphaGo Zero is now teaching us how to play Go. And so human beings are basically out of the loop. And Lee Sidol himself acknowledged this last month uh, when he basically gave up. Um, so we have these two trends taking place at the moment, this explosion of data uh, coupled to technology and the development within computer science of really quite remarkable ways of, um, of um, learning without knowledge. So the point here is that AlphaGo Zero has no domain knowledge. It knows nothing about Go. And yet it learns how to play it better and orders of magnitude better than we can. Um, and so it's not hard to imagine what the consequences of this uh, confluence of developments will be uh, we have lots of data and very new methods of analyzing it, which are extremely successful, at least within certain limited domains. Uh, and it's clear that biology is going through a transformation. And uh, among those uh, in the um, computer science world, and Tony mentioned that I had in a previous life actually been in that world, and so I know some of these people. Um, and uh, they actually think that those of us who worry about biology from a sort of mechanistic point of view in terms of trying to understand how it works are deeply anachronistic um, and that this uh, is terribly old-fashioned and if we would just get out of the way and give them the data they would work it all out 
Um, and although they don't often say that in public, other people have said it for them. So we are facing, as it were, the end of our way of life. Um, right. Well, what's been the response of that um, from those of us who do think about mechanism? Well, I think the response has been rather along the lines of, well, if you can't beat them, let's join them. Um, so in place of big data, we have big models. Um, and I point out here uh, just a few examples. There are many others. Uh, Dennis Noble um, work on uh, over a long period of time, and this goes back now many years, to trying to develop um, physiologically accurate models of uh, a whole heart. And then more recently, Marcus Covert's work on models of a whole cell. This is a, a parasite, so the extent to which is really a whole cell, I think, can be argued. Mycoplasma genitalium. Um, and here, her Henry Markram's work on the European Human Brain Project, which is attempting to simulate a patch of neocortex. Um, now, the um, philosophy, if one likes, of all of these um, uh, developments um, draws, I think, from my experience in engineering and physics, that um, we can model reality. And I think physics uh, gives us some hope that that might be true, that Schrodinger's equations is somehow a, 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 a correct model of the quantum mechanical world. And if it were the case that these models started from Schrodinger's equation and then worked, that might be okay, but they don't. These models are phenomenological. There's rather hypotheses about what is working. And so this expectation that they are going to provide, as it were, a representation of reality which is independent of the questions that we're asking, I think is very problematic. And I certainly have had a lot of problems with that and have written about that. But actually, I think um, the best people to comment on this are not scientists, but um, novelists. And I'm sure some of you will be familiar um, with the uh, essay of Borges on cartography. And it's much uh, discussed uh, in this context of the distinction between the map and the territory. Uh, but I think he was actually preceded by Lewis Carroll many years ago uh, in a very, not very well known one of his later novels. And I think Carroll captured the point with less bite, but perhaps more humor uh, in, in this comment, which I'm sure you can read for yourself. So uh, this is particularly relevant, I think, to some of the models that we talked about on the uh, previous page. Um, so um, if you go to Marcus Covert's model, for instance, um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't include post-translational modifications. Um, if you go to Henry Markram's model, of the brain, glial cells are not included. So literally, if there's any biology for which those things are relevant, uh, the model can't even begin to answer the question, or if it does, it will not answer it correctly. So, um, so we have this problem that these attempts to create big models are, are run into this problem of the mismatch between model and reality. And of course, the problem with building these gigantic models, and some of these really are gigantic, is that the model then attains some of the complexity of the reality, and the answers it gives us might become increasingly inscrutable. Um, and I think the person who said this much better than anyone else is actually Douglas Adams in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and I expect some of you might be familiar uh, with this particular comment. Um, and I, I've left out some aspects of the story here, uh, one of which is the time it takes for the computer to come up with the answer, which in this case is seven million years. Um, but the point is, um, the answers become increasingly inscrutable the larger the model becomes. Okay, so um, where does that leave us? Um, and uh, what I would like to suggest is that in this uh, confrontation that we find, between big models and big data, um, I think the big model approach is a losing strategy and that we need another one. And that this strategy needs to be somewhat radical given the world domination aspects that we have to contend with on the side of big data. Um, and the question I'd like to pose here is whether it's possible for us to get behind the data 
to the reality or closer to the reality. And my good mate, um, Rob Phillips, whom I'm sure Ellen knows well, um, has, uh, has formulated this rather nicely in an article of his in which he points out that it's become somewhat the um, you know, convention these days for quantitative biologists to write papers in which you know, they have figures one to six, all the very nice experiments that people carried out, and then at the end they make a model and the model more or less basically supports the experiments. And it kind of helps to get it into a better journal, right? So, so we have uh, the figure seven model. And Rob is saying, well, hang on a minute. Why not do this the other way around? Let us see if it's possible for theory to actually drive the new kinds of experiments and new explorations and become the first figure rather than the seventh figure. And uh, I think, uh, actually, if you go back into physics, back in the time when quantum mechanics was being developed, this was actually an issue. And there's a very interesting quotation that Einstein made in a letter to Werner Heisenberg, specifically about the foundations of quantum mechanics. And Einstein is taking a much more radical view of the relationship between theory and experiment. And he is basically saying that in reality, it is the theory which describes what we should observe. And so the question is, are we at that point in biology, in the face of these transitions that are taking place, where this becomes more feasible for us to undertake because it certainly hasn't been feasible in the past? So what I want to try and show you is some baby steps that we've been trying to take in this direction, sort of uh, based on this uh, of this uh, philosophy. Okay. Do you mind expanding a bit about what, what the, I'm, I'm not sure I interpret what, what you're saying. The, the theory decides what we can observe. So do you mind explaining in a few more words what, what you mean? Um, so, so, so I think, um, I think in the experiment, experimental biologists are sort of brought up to believe that you create concepts from data, that you start with data and to attempt not to do that is opening oneself to dangerously speculative exercises which one can observe in the history of biology have been very unsuccessful. Uh, and so we start from the data we have and create uh, our explanations and our narrative from that starting point. And the problem with that, I think, the problem that, that's true not just in biology but anywhere and in physics too, is that whatever data you get is merely a projection of what's there. It depends on whatever instrumentation and modalities that one is using. And no matter how many times people say it's unbiased, it never is. It just has a different set of biases to everything else that people are doing. So, so uh, one could consider the alternative that one has some knowledge about the reality, and some of that has come from all the data that we've acquired in the past, and physics, which is somehow foundational, and one might anticipate trying to describe the reality and then interpret what the experiment should say in the light of that. That would be the way I would... Does that, does that help them? Okay, so uh, let, me, let me see if I can walk you through um, one way of, of trying to do that. We've been trying to take in the lab. And this centers around the notion of Hopfield barriers. How are we doing for time, Tony? I'm completely lost as to when we started. 11.45. Okay, that's talking or? Talking. Talking, okay, right. Um, right, so, um, so this, uh, um, this idea starts with asking the question of how energy is used in the context particularly of molecular processes. And in some sense, we know an awful lot about energy transduction in biology. We understand that it's absolutely essential for life. We know a lot about the underlying molecular mechanisms by which energy is, uh, is constructed and used. But at the same time, we don't really understand what it buys us from a functional point of view. Um, and I want to um, sort of pursue that thought. And I think for, from where we stand, the first person to shed some light on this is John Hopfield. Um, shown here in a particularly nice pose on the beach, um, doing calculations. And if you're a molecular biologist, you'll no doubt have heard of kinetic proofreading. Um, and uh, uh, back in the 1970s, 
um, uh, Hopfield was interested in the question of how it was that the error rates in uh, replicating DNA or synthesizing mRNA could be um, so low. And, and they were starting to be measured, and they were getting numbers like 1 in 10 to the 9, 1 in 10 to the 10. And um, uh, Hopfield realized that um, this really needed an explanation from the point of view of physics. And his, um, um, his argument went something like this. So the basic problem we have is to discriminate between a correct and an incorrect substrate. So think of nucleotides. You want to incorporate them in a grain chain, and there's one correct one and the three incorrect ones that you have to deal with. Um, and the basic uh, way we do that is to bind to something. Um, and it is that binding that allows the first stab at telling whether something is correct or incorrect. And typically, in biological context, it is the, um, it is the residence time or the binding time that discriminates between correct and incorrect. A correct substrate binds longer. An incorrect one falls off more quickly. And so it's a difference, if you like, in the off rates, which are faster for the incorrect substrate and uh, slower for the correct substrate. And if you think about that, uh, a binding event will give you some probability um, of, of telling apart the correct from the incorrect substrate. Some an error rate, if you like. Think of it as some small number epsilon that's low, but not very low. Certainly not 1 in 10 to the 9 or 1 in 10 to the 10. But Hopfield thought, well, if you do that once, why not do it twice? Why not take two bites of the cherry? Why not create a mechanism which will move to another state, which allows a second binding or unbinding event? And so Hopfield reasoned, well, if we get an error rate of epsilon with one of these, and an error rate of epsilon with another of these, and we do them both, we should get an error rate of epsilon squared. Where does energy come into the picture? And that's the, that's the subtle point. So this whole argument, by the way, I should say, is being undertaken under the assumption that this machinery is operating at steady state. And this is a very, very common timescale separation that theorists make in looking at biology, and we can certainly debate how appropriate this is. I'm not going to do that, and I'm just going to live with it for the remainder of the talk, okay? But we can talk about it afterwards. So the point is that steady states come in two very significantly different varieties. And I have to say, I'm a mathematician. I was trained as a pure mathematician. It took me a long time to understand this. Um, okay, so here we have two kinds of steady state. Um, so a steady state, remember, is a situation in which the basic variables are not changing over time. So in the context of that little system we were describing, the probabilities of those states are not changing over time. But here are two ways of achieving a steady state. You could have water in a, in a sink. There's no water coming in and there's no water going out. The level is steady. But you could also open the tap and you could open the drain. And after a while, these will come into um, balance with each other, and the level will also not change. That's a steady state. Uh, these are very different steady states. To a physicist, this state is one of thermodynamic equilibrium. And thermodynamic equilibrium is a really, really, really strange steady state. And uh, if you're a physicist, that's kind of obvious. If you're a mathematician like that, you say, really? That's actually true? Um, and I won't go into the details. There are things called uh, detailed balance and microscopic reversibility. And just to give you a sense of the subtlety here, these properties of equilibrium states can't be deduced from thermodynamics. Uh, they actually require much greater subtlety. They depend on the time reversal symmetry of the laws of physics. And mostly if you go to a thermodynamics course, a statistical mechanics course in an undergraduate course, uh, you won't see a proof of this. So there's something very special about states of thermodynamic equilibrium. But maybe a better way to talk about it is to say that if you're at thermodynamic equilibrium, imagine that you could take a movie of the molecular interactions. Well, you can't tell whether that movie is going forwards or backwards. That's another way of saying the peculiarity of the equilibrium state. Now, if you're away from thermodynamic equilibrium, you can. Despite the fact that it's a steady state, there is a direction of time. The forward-running movie and the backward-running movie can be statistically distinguished. Okay. So another way to say it 
is this notion of path dependence and path independence. And for that I have to come back to the diagram that I wrote up here. Um, and what is the problem with Hopfield's scheme is that if this machinery is operating at equilibrium, at thermodynamic equilibrium, then the probability of this exit state is not sensitive to whether one byte or two bytes of the cherry were taken. And I can unwrap that mathematically if you really want to, but this is path independence at thermodynamic equilibrium. And so there's no way for the system to tell whether it's had one byte or two. So you get the same error rate no matter how complicated the internal workings are if the system is at thermodynamic equilibrium. And there's only one way to do better. What is is you have to break detailed balance, you have to put energy into the system, and Hopfield suggested that the energy should enter here. It breaks detailed balance, and the result is the system is now in a non-equilibrium steady state, and it can actually tell that the, 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 the molecules have taken one path rather than another. And that's how you get the improvement in the error rate. It's not quite epsilon squared, there's more stuff to say there, but that's the core of the argument. So Hopfield said this in 1970, and I think actually he said a lot more, and it's really quite relevant to what we have to think about today. I think really there's a general principle here, which is true not just for this particular property of discrimination and the particular case of DNA synthesis, it's a general principle for any information processing task that a cell might be carrying out. And basically it says, that if the machinery that's responsible for that task is operating at equilibrium, a thermodynamic equilibrium, then there's basically a hard limit to how well it can perform that task. And that limit comes from physics. And it doesn't matter how complicated the system is, it can't do better than that. The only way to do better than that is to take the system away from thermodynamic equilibrium by supplying it with continuously with energy. And then Hopfield waved his hands, kinetic proofreading was his example of how you could do this, waved his hands that you could actually improve things arbitrarily, provided you put sufficient energy into the system. One of the things he didn't discuss is that once you start putting energy into the system, you actually typically have to satisfy multiple functionalities. And one of the things you want to do is you have to worry about time. Because you might be able to get a very low error rate, but you don't want to wait forever to do it. Isn't that intrinsic in biology? Biology is, is by definition out of the equilibrium. We are... Um, y so, yes, absolutely. But it's... Uh, it, the application of physics in the biological context has nearly always centered on taking an equilibrium assumption because it works. As to what's happening in reality, absolutely. But it is not clear that the equilibrium assumption isn't adequate in certain circumstances. So. Okay, so I think what Hopfield was saying in his 1973 paper is something that is much richer and much broader and something that we can actually use as a strategy for thinking about molecular biology now. Um, and what I want to show you in the time we have left is an example of what this kind of hot field barrier, as we call it, the equilibrium limit to what we can uh, determine for an information processing task, what this looks like in a particular case. Okay, so for that, we're going to switch gears slightly and start thinking about gene regulation. Um, and. Um, we're going to look at a particular example here, just to uh, be concrete. Um, and this is an example of um, a gene that's expressed in the early Drosophila embryo. So this is a picture of an antibody stain for the expression of the protein hunchback in an early Drosophila embryo. It's not yet cellularized. Um, and you see here that the protein is expressed in the anterior end and to some extent in the posterior end, you might just see. Um, and there's a very sharp boundary between the protein being expressed and not being expressed. And if you do careful microscopy studies, um, and this was done by a quartet of eminent 
um, physicists and biologists at Princeton, who I'm sure Stas knows well, if I can see Stas somewhere in the audience. Um, and um, you can show that um, the response of this uh, protein hunchback, and I should explain that hunchback at this point in uh, the development of the Drosophila is regulated by a maternal morphogen, it's called bicoid, uh, which is expressed um, across the embryo in a sort of decaying concentration here. Um, and if you stain for bicoid and hunchback and you normalize and you plot things, what you see is that as bicoid concentration increases, so does hunchback concentration until it saturates. And these curves are very well fitted um, to this um, functional form that we see here, which is an example of a Hill function. And if you're a molecular biologist, you know what a Hill function is. And I would remind you that Archibald Vivian Hill introduced this class of functions for describing experimental data. Originally, it was the data for her oxygen binding to hemoglobin. Um, and this has been a very successful class of functions for fitting various kinds of sigmoidal data surprisingly well. And the Hill function has no biophysical basis. It's just a, and Hill was very clear about this, it's the simplest thing that works. Um, but it has no uh, foundation uh, from biochemistry or biophysics. It's just a fit to the data. Okay, so, so what we're interested in here is understanding how um, this uh, relatively simple gene uh, expression, hunchback being regulated by bicoid, can achieve this kind of functional form with a Hill coefficient, Hill function with a Hill coefficient of five. All right, so that's really the problem that we're setting out to, to look at here. Um, and we're going to approach this um, with an elaboration of the, uh, uh, the little diagrams that I showed you when we were talking about um, Hopfield's work. Hopfield really used that as a picture, but one of the things that we've done in the lab over several years is develop a graph-based approach to Markov processes. So that's the sort of mathematical substructure that's running underneath what I'm going to tell you here. We're really talking about Markov processes and we approach them through this graph theoretic, uh, formal graph theoretic way. And, and this is just a, a, an illustration of the kind of model that we might build if we were thinking about a, uh, um, um, a gene that is being regulated by a transcriptional activator, which is here binding to two sites. Um, and uh, the kind of model that we have of how this is working is broadly based on Patashny's view of regulated recruitment. So we think of um, the uh, machinery, the regulatory machinery at the gene as recruiting the polymerase to um, its target. And uh, the, uh, the activity of the gene is measured by the probability of polymerase being present at steady state. Now, the point of this kind of uh, machinery here is that um, uh, I haven't elaborated by pointing out what these transition rates are, but the idea here is that these transition rates could be affected by the underlying machinery or complexity that is always present in eukaryotic genes, chromatin state, post-translational modifications of histones, mediator, all of this complexity is not explicitly present in this model but the idea is that they reflect themselves in the rates, the transition rates for these transitions. Um, and this is a sort of compromise between um, making the model too complicated, but making sure that somehow the complexity that is there is reflected in the level of abstraction that we're actually using here. So this is a little bit of a trade-off that we're doing here, but this is one of the advantages of this graph theoretic framework that it allows one, in some sense, to do this. And in particular, to keep track of the free energies that are at work in the equilibrium context. Okay, so I won't elaborate this further. Um, I'm happy to do that if you want to chat about it afterwards, but just to say that this kind of model gives rise to a description of what we call a gene regulation function, which is the, how the output of the gene, which is taken to be proportional to the probability of polymerase being recruited, how that depends on the concentration of the upstream transcription factor, in this case, the transcriptional activator that we're dealing with. 
Okay, so we end up with a function, and this function, of course, has a lot more complexity under the hood, which are the transition rates that are implicitly there, which I'm, I'm not writing out here. Okay, so we can, we can build models of this kind, and they give rise to a gene regulation function, and we're interested in understanding the sharpness of this function, which is to say how the shape of this function changes as we change the concentration of the transcription factor. So we're going to measure sharpness in two ways. And um, it's important that we do that in two ways. And uh, again, I don't want to get into too many difficulties here, but this is the basic idea. You take the, the gene regulation function, you normalize it appropriately, and then you look at the, the derivative of the function, okay? the, the tangent. And you look at the maximum of the derivative, and the position on the x-axis at where that maximum occurs. Okay? So the maximum we call the steepness and the position we call the position. Really bad names, but you know how it is. You, you come up with these names in some meeting and after that they, they're, they're stuck in stone forever. Right? Okay, so position and steepness. And this is the way we're thinking about the shape of this function. So I'm going to show you a plot of position and steepness. And, um, there's a lot in it, and there are actually three stories embedded in here, so I, I will try and take you through this um, a bit at a time. Okay, so this is a plot of position and steepness. And let's just focus for a moment on this magenta line here. That's the position and steepness of the Hill functions, that class of functions that Hill first put forward as a way of measuring sharpness. And these uh, magenta crosses mark the integer points of the Hill coefficient. Okay, so that's the magenta line. It's just to give you a, a little bit of a, uh, a familiar um, mark. Okay, so these, uh, these dots that you see there are actually experimental data. And this is experimental data for a synthetic hunchback promoter. So it's synthetic in the sense that, as far as we know, the only thing that is binding in this regulatory region is hunchback to six sites. And as far as we know, nothing else is binding. Okay. Um, and these experimental data points are one from each embryo, where we look at the slice, we do essentially the same kind of calculation and analysis that was done previously and we get the experimental gene regulation function and we determine its position and steepness and we plot it on this point. And as you can see, the data points are, uh, are nicely clustered and the green is the average uh, and it's extremely close to the point that specifies the Hill function of Hill coefficient 6, which is very consistent with the findings of the previous paper that I mentioned, which had five transcription factor binding sites, but Hill coefficient 5, um, but um, um, uh, the data is it's spread out around that particular point. Okay, so those are two of the things there. Now I'm, I'm going to sort of ignore these blue curves here, which I don't want to get into, but um, what we're seeing here in this black region is basically um, the position and steepness of randomly selected gene regulation functions. So we have a way of generating these functions. We can randomly choose their parameter values within some range, which is indicated there. And for each of those gene regulation functions, we get a position and steepness, and we plot it. And then we try to determine the boundaries of that region. And the boundaries of that region are indicated by this, um, uh, by this curve that you see here. OK, so one of the features of this curve is that it has this cusp that reaches up but doesn't actually get to the point with Hill coefficient 6. And if I increase the parameter range, what happens is that this black region doesn't expand to cover the whole space. It actually um, increases very slightly and stabilizes. It's, in fact, the asymptotic boundary is very close to the one that I'm showing here. If you go up to 10 to the minus 5, say, it's, it's pretty much on the asymptotic boundary. And this cusp gets closer and closer to the Hill coefficient 6. OK. So um, one of the stories here is that 
even with this uh, boundary here, which allows, if you like, for all possible contributions of free energy to the regulator recruitment of the polymerase. Uh, it's basically anything that you could possibly accomplish under the assumption of thermodynamic equilibrium is allowed for in this model. And as you see, uh, it really doesn't account for the data. <laughs> I mean, you could argue about it. Some of the data points fall within the region, but most of them don't. But this paper does a lot more and basically shows that you can't accommodate this data under the assumptions that we've been making here. And specifically, you can't accommodate it under this assumption of thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay. So what happens, so, 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 so the thing to, to keep in mind here is that under conditions of thermodynamic equilibrium, the sharpness of your gene regulation function can never, can not get, exceed the number of transcription factor binding sites. You have six sites, you get to Hill coefficient six, nearly, but you never quite get there. So the Hill function, which was just a fit, is suddenly assuming a somewhat more biophysical form. It's kind of very close to what is actually biophysically well-founded and for which you can give specific attribution of where the free energy comes from. So what happens if we break this assumption of thermodynamic equilibrium? Now I would like to be able to show you what this plot looks like under the same conditions, but I can't. Um, I'm going to show it to you for the case of two transcription factor binding sites and you're going to say why. Time? Four or five minutes. Four or five minutes, okay. Um, and um, uh, we'll come to, in a minute, why that is, but for the moment let me just show you what happens. So this is a similar kind of plot here, as I said, under the condition of two transcription factor binding sites, and I'm sorry the colors have changed, but this blue region here is the equivalent of the black region on the previous slide. It's the equilibrium region of position and steepness. And as you see, if we break detailed balance, we allow the system to be away from thermodynamic equilibrium, we have a much, much larger region. So you can reach a Hill coefficient of four with two sites if you're away from equilibrium. So in other words, what we've demonstrated here is the existence of a Hopfield barrier. Okay? And, and so, forgive me, I'm a mathematician and I can't resist the temptation to actually show you that there are sometimes theorems in biology. And the theorem here is that we actually have an interpretation of what the Hill function is some 70 years after Hill first introduced it. It is a Hopfield barrier. It is the Hopfield barrier for sharpness. If you have N transcription factor binding sites and a transcriptional activator, the Hopfield barrier for sharpness is the Hill function with coefficient N. And that's what this preceding slides have demonstrated. Okay, so that's nice. Um, and what it suggests to us is that this strategy of trying to understand Hopfield barriers and also understand what happens once you're past Hopfield barriers is actually a potential way to go back into a lot of classical mo molecular biology and sort of think about it from this more functional and biophysical perspective. But I, I want to finish by pointing out some of the challenges that we have to face here. And I'm going to skip over this slide, which is really about the experimental challenges, which are very interesting and serious, but uh, in the interests of time, I really want to get to the theoretical challenge here. Um, and it comes back to this, this issue that was at the center of what Hopfield was trying to tell us in his 1973 paper, which is this issue of path dependence. Okay, So when you're at thermodynamic equilibrium, it doesn't really matter what path you take to calculate steady state probabilities. All the paths are the same. That's path independence. But when you're away from equilibrium, it's not just that you have to worry about paths. It's much, much worse than that. You have to worry about all the paths. And the way you do that, there's a kind of mathematical bookkeeping for doing that. And it involves these things called spanning trees, which if you don't know what they are, don't worry. It's just a graph construction. I'm just enumerating. I'm just counting how many spanning trees you have to worry about. And if you have this graph uh, that I've been showing you, which is two transcription factor binding sites and polymerase, it has eight vertices. And we have to worry about 384 spanning trees. I mean, that's a lot, actually, to do a calculation. You have 384 of these, and there's a lot of algebra with each one. 
but I just want you to have a, a guess as to what you think you have to deal with when you go from two to three. Hmm? Millions. How many? Millions. How many millions? 20. Very good. 42 million. Okay. Right. So what we stumble on here, and as a mathematician, I have to say I was really surprised, is actually an unsolved problem of physics. So basically, this is what you need to do to exactly calculate the non-equilibrium steady state probability. And how do physicists approach this problem? And let so it's in infinite, infinite. No, they do worse than that, I think. Okay. Um, and this is my redefinition of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. It's the art of throwing away trees. Okay, so that's really what happens. That's what you do. You throw most of these trees away by saying they're irrelevant or they don't matter. And that's the only way you can do it in the physics world. And the physicists are very reluctant to admit this. I have a lot of physicists in the lab. We have a lot of arguments about this. Um, and, uh, but, but that is really the problem. And it's a serious problem in biology because I think in the biological context, it is very reasonable to believe that actually many things happen because of lots of small effects. Not because of a few dominant ones, but really because of a lot of... And you can make a sort of evolutionary argument that that's actually how it should be working, right? And so I actually think that what we see here is that there is this huge unexplored space that we haven't entered because the physicists don't know how to do the calculations. And it's rather interesting for me as a mathematician to find that biology has bringing out these fundamental issues in physics and mathematics which um, we were unaware of. So I will leave you with a very quick summary of what I said there and I, I won't keep this up because I think it should be fairly clear where I've been trying to go with this. I think there's an evolutionary question that I haven't talked about which for me has always been a motivating factor. I'd like to give special thanks to my collaborator Angela de Pace who's a Drosophila geneticist and was uh, conversations with Angela over many years that started some of this this work and Jihei Park who actually got the data that I showed there earlier um, this is uh, our lab, um, some of the people who collaborate, and I should say thank you to a, a, a lot of undergraduate and graduate students over the years who contributed to the development of the theory we've been using. And let me leave you with some of our choices of potential futures to consider. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.